Thank you, President. My question is for the Minister for Housing, Minister Xing. 44 years, that is the average age of death for homeless people in this country, almost 40 years less than the average Australian. This was the finding from Guardian Australia's investigation into 10 years worth of coronial death notifications where homelessness was documented. These premature deaths reflect a population who are so often overlooked and who must deal with systemic failures in essential services like health, justice and housing. When you are struggling to find somewhere safe to sleep, everything else becomes secondary and good health especially becomes a luxury. So my question is, would the Minister consider prioritising access to social housing for those with chronic health conditions and risk of premature death? Minister. Thank you, Ms Payne, for your question and for your ongoing interest in the often very complex causes and contributors to homelessness and to rough sleeping. It's really important that when we talk about rough sleeping and homelessness, we can understand the causes and the contributing factors uh, that do often exacerbate a situation of vulnerable or insecure housing. Whether that's a, a dependency on alcohol or other drugs, drugs including prescription and non-prescription medication, whether that's challenges around mobility, being a victim or survivor of family violence, uh, being within our youth cohort or somebody who is um, older. We know that the needs and the priorities of people in addressing root causes of homelessness are many and varied. And that in order to provide support for people to move from precarious uh, situations, um, whether they are accessing homelessness and supports in crisis accommodation, in temporary housing or indeed moving through to the social housing system, uh, that it takes not just a roof over people's heads. It requires programs and services and supports. One of the things that we are doing is investing in supports to provide measures of financial assistance to people as well as a fixed address and making sure that we can respond to a growth in demand. So every year we see around 100,000 people accessing homelessness supports uh, and uh, in 22-23, for example, there were around 40,900 people within that list who'd experienced family violence, around 9,000 people who were sleeping rough or in an inadequate dwelling uh, when they first presented to services. Around 11,200 people um, aged between 15 and 24, again within that, that age demographic you've referred to, presenting alone to services. And then also around uh, just under 12,000 people um, uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, identity and community. So the report on government services, which has been referred to a number of times in this um, house, indicates that we have here in Victoria supported the largest number of homelessness and support services expenditure in comparison to other jurisdictions? Does that mean that we have done all we need to do? No. Um, does that mean that we understand what does work and what can work to alleviate those pressures? Yes. For every number that I refer to in these statistics and for the statistics that you've outlined in your question, um, we have a, a person and a family and a story, and also an awful lot of potential and opportunity for people to be able to um, secure their own autonomy and their own prospects. So we've got new housing programs such as Housing First. Um, we've got the Sacred Heart Missions new campus of care. Um, we've got a range of supports in house homelessness to a home programs. And it's about making sure that they work to get together across a whole of government um, approach in order to develop those things, including with Thank local you, and federal Thompson's government five. as required. Mr. Ms Payne for supplementary. Thank you, President, and I thank the Minister for her detailed response. And um, by way of supplementary, housing is just one part of the essential services people need to get back on their feet. And, and as you have mentioned, wraparound services that focus on things like mental health, family violence, youth services, rehabilitation, justice and education can be extremely beneficial. Will the Minister commit to ensuring that social housing developments pursue a wraparound model that integrates support services wherever possible? Minister. 
thank you, Ms Payne, for that supplementary question. The short answer is yes. Um, we are working on a range of programs and initiatives, uh, including the Housing First Principles. I'm very happy to, um, to take you through that work as it relates to um, providing that support to transition through to stable housing and to make sure that we've got that model of care um, around Homes First, which is intended to commence from about the middle of this year and to build on existing frameworks for support. Um, that model itself, by way of an example, that will provide 500 households with priority access to social housing uh, and three years of wraparound support. And that builds on the success of homelessness to a home, which is allocated around 1,845 housing and support packages since 2020. And that assists people to recover from homelessness. Um, we also recognise that preventing homelessness is a really important part of this work. And that's with a housing statement and being able to build, for example, a granny flat on a home uh, block of at least 300 metres is just one of the examples Thank to you. take pressure Tom's off fine. the system.